everybody to our second Monday uh, Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health or POPFAM seminar. Um, I am Terry McGovern. I'm honored to be the chair of the Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health and I'm really thrilled about today's seminar for many, many reasons that I'll, I'll quickly go through. Um, Neha, could we have the slides? I'm actually at 60 Haven today, so, uh, so I'm uh, looking out at the Hudson River, which is really nice. Um, okay, so we have this great group that we'll be hearing from. Um, let's go to the first slide. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're talking about today, which is the expanded global gag rule. So um, I'm just going to start off, give a little bit of background and then I'm going to pass it off to Sarah Casey, who will introduce the rest of the panel, but I'm going to give you some basic definitions. So the Mexico City policy, or what everybody calls the global gag rule, was first introduced by Ronald Reagan in 1984. It's been rescinded by every Democratic president and reinstated by every Republican president. Uh, the policy requires foreign non-governmental organizations that re receive U.S. funding to certify that they will not provide counsel on or refer for abortion or advocate for the liberalization of abortion laws, even if they engage in these activities with their own non-U.S. funds. During his first week in office, President Trump reinstated and dramatically expanded the global gag rule renaming it the Protecting Life in Global Health Assistance Policy. So past iterations, the policy only applied to U.S. family planning assistance. This was approximately 400, 500 million during the George W. Bush administration, but under President Trump, it now applies to all global health assistance furnished by departments or agencies which is about 11 billion as opposed to 400 to 500 million in the prior policy. This expanded global gag rule has the potential to, to affect not only international family planning programs, but also the broader field of global health, including HIV, malaria, TB, nutrition, WASH, and other health areas. Uh, next slide, please. The policy affects different kinds of organizations in different ways, some directly, some indirectly. Foreign NGOs must weigh whether to comply with the policy's restrictions or lose their eligibility to, lose, to receive U.S. government funding. U.S.-based NGOs are not directly subject to the policy, but they still must monitor their foreign subrecipients to ensure they comply with the policy. So this slide is trying to show you some of the complexity that we have here. In March 2019, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced a further expansion of the global gag rule. This is called the Pompeo expansion, and that gagged NGOs, it, it, it under the Pompeo expansion, gagged NGOs must ensure that their foreign NGO subgrantees comply with the global gag rule, even if these subgrantees do not receive any U.S. government global health assistance from any source. So think about that. This expansion essentially gags funds provided by non-U.S. government donors which indirectly affects multilateral organizations, as well as NGOs that do not receive any U.S. funding at all. And finally, last week, the Trump administration proposed yet another expansion of the policy, which would extend it to all U.S. global health contracts, which, make, which would make up 40% of U.S. global health aid. Um, so our study, uh, begun in 2018, uh, we launched a multi-country study to assess the effects of the Trump administration's ever-expanding global gag rule. The primary research question, which my colleagues are going to talk about, 
is how does the expanded global gag rule affect provision of and access to sexual and reproductive health services? We're now in the third year of the project. The team has completed data collection and analysis. We partnered with the Journal of Sexual and Reproductive Health Matters to produce a special issue highlighting our results. Um, in this presentation, we're gonna share some key findings from the research. And then two former students, Naomi Gaspard and Maggie McGee, will share some insights from their experience is, as research assistants working on the project. I'm about to introduce Sarah Casey, uh, but before I do that, I wanna see, say that I think the students working on this project, the faculty working on this project, the staff working on the project really have uh, exhibited what I would call excellence and actually uh, have proceeded in a way that I think is kind of an example. We have partners at the country level that led on many of our papers. We held a big meeting of advocates and researchers from the countries to talk about strategies around mitigation. We have every step of the way worked in partner with our colleagues in these three countries and also negotiated the way, ways forward with our advocacy partners. So uh, this is all very exciting to me. Um, again, I wanna say these two students have been absolutely amazing in their persistence, dedication, and the excellence of their work. Dr. Sarah Casey, who I'm about to introduce, uh, focuses on using sound data collection and analysis to improve the availability and quality of sexual and reproductive health services in countries whose health systems have been weakened by war or, nat or natural disaster. She is the director of the Reproductive Health Access Information and Services in Emergencies Initiative which is a global program which collaborates with program partners to identify and respond to challenges to improve contraceptive and abortion-related services in humanitarian settings in Africa and Asia. She provides technical guidance to partners to establish program monitoring and evaluation systems and conduct health facility assessments, population-based surveys, and other implementation research. And um, has set the standard for excellence uh, throughout this entire three years around this research. So um, thank you, Sarah, Emily, Maggie, Naomi. Over to you, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Terry. So I, next slide, Neha. So I'm going to, re I'm really here just to introduce the study, and then um, we're going to have um, our colleagues who've really worked closely on, on the study, present the, the country results that they are, that are nearest and dearest to their hearts. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start, I'll be talking about the methods and then I will hand over to Maggie McGee, who is a 2020 PopFam graduate and PHHA certificate, who was an RA with um, this project and did her practicum in Kenya, working with our partners there um, on the project. Then Emily Maestrellis, who's the senior program officer who is managing this project, um, herding all of the different cats that we'll be talking about throughout this presentation um, and keeping us all on track. We'll talk about Nepal. And then Naomi Gaspard, who's uh, also a 2020 graduate with the Global Health Certificate. Um, she did her practicum in Madagascar with our team there and then continued to work um, with us on this work. And she's actually, she and I have spent a lot of time together the last few weeks trying to um, work on the analysis of the Madagascar results so that they could be included in this um, special issue of sexual reproductive health matters. So next slide, Neha. So as um, Professor McGovern mentioned, we're, we were trying to look at the provision of an access to sexual reproductive health and other health services in three countries. And we selected these countries, Kenya, Nepal, and Madagascar, because we were looking for three very different contexts. Um, so all three countries do receive a significant um, amount of funding from the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. government contribution, contribution to their um, development aid is quite, quite substantial. 
in the 80 to 90 percent in um, each of these three countries. Um, but they have very different abortion contexts. So Madagascar has one of the world's strictest abortion laws. Um, abortion is prohibited and there are no explicit exceptions. While Nepal is at the other end of the spectrum, they, uh, their law allows abortion upon request up to 12 weeks of pregnancy and then up to 28 weeks in cases of rape, fetal abnormality or threat to the life of uh, the woman. Um, in Nepal, abortion services are provided free in government health facilities. Um, and in Kenya, is sort of in the middle. Um, their 2010 constitution does permit abortion in cases of rape, fetal abnormality, or to preserve the woman's life or health. In each of these three countries, we partnered with a local research institution, um, the APHRC in Kenya, CREPA in Nepal, and INSPC in Madagascar. And so these partners really led the in-country uh, data collection. Um, they helped identify where we should conduct uh, where we should conduct interviews and sort of who we should reach out to. Um, in all three countries, we conducted interviews at the central level, so in the capital city, um, as well as in um, other rural areas. So you could see in each country we have highlighted um, the sort of districts where we collected data. So it was three counties in Kenya, 22 districts in Nepal, um, and eight regions in Madagascar. Next slide, please. We conducted interviews with a range of stakeholders to really try to capture the effect of global gag rule at different levels of the health system. Um, so in each country, uh, we spoke with representatives of US-based and foreign NGOs, including sort of international NGOs, as well as um, local NGOs or community-based organizations. Uh, we spoke with service providers, so um, health workers that provide sexual reproductive health services in both private and public health facilities. Um, in Nepal and Madagascar, we spoke with representatives from the Ministry of Health at both central and regional levels. And then in Madagascar, we also interviewed community health workers and uh, contraceptive clients. Um, and talking to NGOs, we were really trying to ask about you know, how had, you know, what was the communication they'd received about global gag rule? How had they changed um, their policies and practices, if at all? Um, how had their funding changed? Um, and how did they sort of pass on information if they were impacted by global gag rule down to their um, project level staff and um, health facilities that they supported? At the health facilities, we really asked about changes in staffing, supplies, and service delivery um, based on global gag rule. And then with uh, contraceptive clients in Madagascar, we essentially asked women if they had noticed a change in their ability to access uh, contraception. Um, in Nepal, interviews were conducted in two phases about a year apart to see some changes over time. So some in Nepal, some of the participants were interviewed twice at two different time periods, while others were interviewed only once. Um, and one thing of note is the Pompeo expansion was announced um, between phase one and two of data collection in Nepal. So we were able to capture some of the impact of that uh, expansion. In addition to the country level, we did also conduct some interviews with stakeholders at the global level, but we're not going to talk about these those today. So now I'm going to hand it off to Maggie McGee to talk about some key results from Kenya. Hi. Um, so to begin with Kenya, um, as Dr. Casey mentioned, we conducted interviews both at the NGO level as well as at the health facility level. And together, those results really helped us sort of trace how the effect of the global gag rule um, sort of trickles down through the Kenyan health system. So at the NGO level, um, we found some organizations who had been forced to choose between U.S. funding and projects related to safe abortion. One participant pretty um, poignantly described this as a choice between the lesser of two evils because for them, either choice meant 
sacrificing one important funding stream and having to disrupt some element of their work in some way. Um, and in Kenya, like an interesting and sort of concerning element of this choice as it plays out is that because the US provides so much funding for HIV programming in particular in Kenya, um, many participants felt like this choice between US funding and um, abortion related activities was really a choice between working in HIV at all and working in um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health. And that the gag rule sort of forced NGOs to silo themselves into either um, HIV or um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health. Um, so in this quote, we have a local NGO that had been providing HIV testing and treatment services with US funding and then um, they've had to stop this service because they decided not to sign the gag rule in order to protect um, a larger a larger safe abortion project. And that was um, a theme that we saw reflected quite a bit in the data, especially at the NGO level. Um, next slide. And then at the facility level, we had many participants who reported staffing shortages and commodity shortages and stockouts since the implementation of the global gag rule. Um, but at the facility level, it was a little bit more difficult to determine attribution, like to what extent were these changes the result of the global gag rule or could they have been the result of something else? Um, and that was challenging primarily because there really are a lot of other health systems issues and supply chain um, issues that are affecting staffing and um, commodities at these health facilities. But what we found is that both public and private facilities um, did receive quite a bit of support from various NGOs and that when facility level respondents talked about um, staffing shortages or commodity stockouts that these were often linked to reduced support from NGOs and then by sort of triangulating with some of our NGO interviews, we were able to find some instances where those same NGOs had indeed reported um, feeling, you know, experiencing some of the harmful effects of the global gag rule. So this quote um, is from one of those facilities. Um, the provider is explaining how they used to receive support from this NGO, but now they're not anymore. Um, and then later in this quote, the provider goes on to say that they've tried to acquire these same commodities from a government supplier, but the government supplier um, really isn't able to provide all of those commodities all of the time. So while the global gag rule is definitely not the only factor creating these shortages and issues at the facility, it's undermining the ability of NGOs to provide support and exacerbating you know, some of these supply chain issues and health system weaknesses that already exist in the health system in Kenya. And that's the end of that slide. So for Nepal, um, there has been less global gag rule research done in Nepal compared to Kenya. Um, and many findings do overlap and overlap globally, as we've learned in talking to other colleagues during this research as well. But of course, some uh, of the findings uh, are unique to the country context. And in Nepal, it's really important to remember of the three countries and of, you know, out of many countries where this research is being done around the world, the, the context for abortion is significantly different. So a very, very legal abortion, I'm sorry, <laughs> liberal abortion law. And SRHR in general is not politicized in Nepal in the way that it is in the United States and in many of these countries around the world. So you might think that the health system is more resilient to this policy. However, our results indicate that sexual reproductive health service delivery in both the public and private health sectors is compromised because of the policy and particularly referral systems that connect those institutions and, and entities together. And interestingly for us, I think as researchers, we found that it was more unnecessary over restrictions on allowable services that we saw most in the data. So for example, our results uh, indicate that many certifying NGO facilities stopped referring clients for any sexual health service to non-certifying facilities. So that would include groups like family planning. 
Now, the policy, of course, as we saw uh, on the initial slide, does not govern family planning services at all um, and also allows for abortion services under limited conditions. But we heard both from uh, organizations that certified the policy uh, and organizations that did not certify the policy that referrals both out and in for contraception and for abortion under those allowable circumstances was compromised, was not happening. Um, and that was is also reflective of a larger issue where partnerships between organizations are severed because of this policy in term in, that includes long term partnerships. So one facility reported to us, you know, for many years, we've had a relationship with another facility, they, they refer in many contraceptive clients to us and without explanation that stopped the relationship has stopped. We don't really understand why the assumption and through triangulation is discussed in the Kenya results helps us understand that this is most likely because of the policy. Um, and also hearing from those uh, certifying facilities that are the ones that push out referrals that they've stopped doing this as well helps us kind of piece together this picture. So uh, this quote actually refers to a different kind of exception in the policy, which is called the passive referral. Uh, and this is an exception for abortion referrals if pregnant clients come into a health facility, ask for abortion, say, they are pregnant, they have decided already they want to terminate this pregnancy and the purpose of their visit today is to, is to receive a referral for an abortion. There are a couple of other requirements or criteria that have to be met per the policy in order to enable that referral, but it is allowed under the policy. And in a context like Nepal, again, that could be um, a really important harm mitigation me measure um, and a, a mechanism to maintain the sovereignty of this context, which has made specific decisions around abortion in this liberal context. However, as this quote reads, last time you had mentioned about passive referral and being USAID funded, you're allowed to do that. That was the interviewer's question. The respondent says, well, currently even passive referrals can be problematic to us, hence we don't do that. And that's reflective of a tone we heard in many interviews of this sort of, well, to be safe, we're not gonna do this because when you think about the passive referral, four criteria have to be met. How do you measure that? How are you sure someone isn't going to say something uh, to USAID later? And then does that compromise your funding? There are a lot of questions that go through um, you know, these organizations as they determine what's safe for them. And this is an area that we really hope our results can be used by colleagues in advocacy organizations and service delivery organizations to think about how to uh, curb against this unwanted effect where maybe increased education, uh, really understanding where in the policy you can point to that says that this is allowed, could that help, uh, again, in this context where the passive referral could really be a significant measure for harm mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. So in Nepal, uh, again, as the, the prior slide indicates, there are many examples of over-interpretation of the policy. Um, and overinterpretation is a mechanism or manifestation of something called the chilling effect, which uh, we refer to when organizations over restrict themselves out of fear, confusion, or an effort to stay safe, as I mentioned before, maintain compliance uh, with this policy, maintain good relationships with the donor that's important, like the United States. So the chilling effect of the GDR is quite detrimental to health systems all over the, the world, in addition to routine implementation of the GGR. And in Nepal, it hasn't really been documented yet. So this research really, uh, for us, helped us understand how normal impl implementation of the policy affects health systems, but also how harmful this chilling effect can be, particularly this over-interpretation. And in addition to seeing it, the health facility level and in, in those referral relationships, like I mentioned on the prior slide, we see it playing out at the NGO level and even into the government level as well. Um, so at the NGO level, we heard from participants uh, sort of these descriptions about attending meetings, uh, technical coordination meetings, working group meetings, trainings even, uh, where they self-censor uh, because they are concerned that being present with an organization uh, for example, a certifying organization and a non-certifying organization are on the same table uh, when abortion comes up in the discussion. Well, how do you handle that if you're a certifying organization? What if USAID finds out you're at that meeting, for example? Now, discussions about abortion are not prohibited by the policy. And 
specifically, you know, in a space convened by the Ministry of Public Health, for example, like a technical working group meeting, the policy doesn't reach that space. But yet, there is a lot of overinterpretation of the policy by these organizations to maintain uh, compliance in their minds. Um, so this quote here reads, we avoid most of the discussion sessions on abortion due to the policy. Sometimes I show my presence for a few minutes in these meetings and leave the venue. We never know in what way social media interprets our presence. Overall, we stay isolated and focus on our objective. And that shows you sort of that effect of the chilling effect to uh, dismantle, kind of isolate organizations from each other, prohibits kind of, kind of coordination, even though uh, that's really not prohibited by the policy. We've also heard from this particular organization an example whereby they did have a, a problem. I don't remember if it was a social media problem or not, but a photograph of a representative representative of this NGO was at a meeting holding a pamphlet related to post-abortion care. Someone from USAID sees the photograph, thinks that it's an abortion-related pamphlet, safe abortion care-related pamphlet, and caused there was a problem that had the photograph had to be explained. The NGO, you know, of course, only then would retreat into themselves and, and, okay, well, now we have to make sure we're really being careful about our activities, even though the policy in no way, shape, or form governs whether someone holds a pamphlet or reads a pamphlet or participates in a conversation at a meeting about these topics. Um, so uh, that was a particularly important element for us to bring about in, in our paper on the Nepal results. Uh, and next slide, we can move to Madagascar. Hi, everyone. So yes, um, with Madagascar, as Dr. Casey said, we've really been rallying um, to finish up our paper and we're able to submit that last week. Um, so yeah, I just want to start off by saying that even given the context of it being restrictive, um, GGR definitely comes in and exacerbates existing contraceptive supply problems in Madagascar. The health system in Madagascar has central district and regional levels, um, and health financing is very centralized or top down. It's very hard to coordinate, coordinate amongst these levels and regional governments regular um, experience population complications when trying to submit health financing needs. And non-certifying NGOs have helped to support and supply Ministry of Health facilities with contraceptives. Um, but since 2017, there have been many stockouts of family planning supplies. So sometimes certain contraceptives that uh, women use are not available as such um, anywhere in the country. Facilities are experiencing long-term stockouts of contraceptives, especially oral contraceptives and injectables. Um, and in Madagascar, there have been several commitments uh, and investments in increasing access to family planning. So I think this quote here um, really um, is a good example of that. Um, a district Ministry of Health representative says, the impacts are really tangible concerning family planning because people are already used to free family planning services. Then when they were asked to buy them, the numbers lost to follow up increased. Many women are lost to follow up and even our coverage rates have decreased, decreased, decreased. We can say that the impacts in our district were catastrophic because of this disruption in products. We know that these stockouts are caused by several factors, two of these being the U.S. defunding of UNFPA and the global gap rule. Um, in 2015, Madagascar committed to expanding contraceptive services uh, prevalence to 50%. And so again, this quote just really represents several providers' experiences being frustrated, not being able to meet client demand and certain national family planning commitments. Next slide, please. And so again, getting back to the client level, uh, what's really interesting about the Madagascar paper, um, as we noted earlier in the methods section, we really did have a lot of client um, interviews across the country, um, which really just highlight again how this policy impacts people from the top down. So contraceptive clients reported major difficulties in accessing contraceptives because of fewer contraceptive delivery points. And this is again due to reduced financing, fewer um, delivery points. So interviews with community health workers, outreach workers, and clients show how women seeking contraceptives are discouraged by continuous stockouts. Um, a recent report from the U.S. Department of State specifically noted that in Madagascar, USAID had a difficult time finding new partners to continue key contraceptive programming, which supports the data we found with these large gaps in services. Um, clients were sometimes referred to where there might be commodities available, but these women were likely then lost to follow up. And we have um, several interviews where women have kind of lost trust in the healthcare system, so that even when supplies are restored, women might not go back and seek them. Um, several were upset with the lack of transparency from healthcare workers, um, and we also learned about uh, other avenues which women might go through um, to obtain their method of choice, including 
including unsafe practices. So this quote, um, and now there are none at the public health center, so the injectable is so expensive. It costs 78 cents uh, US dollar at the pharmacy. We sell wood to get money for the injectable for this purpose. We have no more to survive, and now I'm pregnant when I didn't want to be. Um, so again, thinking about the top-down level, we uh, heard from several people that when they didn't have their preferred method of choice, weren't able to, um, you know, that resulted in um, unwanted pregnancy. Um, and again, just stresses the need for not just available, but affordable contraceptives. Uh, next slide. So um, transitioning to the student experience, I'll just start off by saying, to kind of describe my practical experience last summer, I'd like to start off with a story about my first day at UNSC. Um, I was told to meet one of the lead researchers, uh, Dr. Holland, early Monday morning. I walked into his office not really knowing what to expect, um, thought we'd start off with introductions, a tour, the usual, but when I walked into his office, we did some brief introductions, um, and then I was taken to a conference room uh, where I met with other colleagues and a little bath. So Naomi is from Columbia University. What are you here to teach us? Um, and I was definitely taken aback, but remember that in our email exchanges, I was introduced as the summer practicum student uh, who was there to teach them how to code our data using in vivo, a software not many of our colleagues were used to. So after that, I responded, if you get me a projector and some transcripts, I can show you a few basic first steps in in vivo. Um, and then I took the training that I had received before leaving from other uh, Columbia student researchers and tried to create an impromptu like in vivo learning session with my new uh, colleagues. So at first I was um, very stressed about having to jump into work without having what I felt was like enough context to begin um, and to do my job well. But this first day experience definitely highlights um, and stresses the importance of adaptability, especially on the ground. Um, and additionally, before leaving Fortana, I was told that data collection at the regional level had been delayed and that I might not get into those interviews for a few weeks. So we tried to think of ways that I could be helpful to Columbia and ENS, they say, even if we weren't doing those. So we decided that I would do interviews with local SRH activists um, and thought it would be really interesting given Madagascar's restrictive abortion context. And um, one interview we described their difficulties bringing up adolescent SRH programming to government stakeholder meetings. And they also talked about um, religion in these spaces, um, something that I just think I wouldn't have learned if I had done this with um, my colleagues. So I was able to um, be creative and strategic in who I met with. I was able to create my own set of interview guides and it gave me the opportunity to network on my own in country and meet with people working on really interesting SRH programs and policies. Thank you, and I'm gonna pass it to Maggie. Um, so like Naomi, I also started working on this project um, for my practicum last summer. Um, I went to Kenya where I did two things. Um, I was working with our research partner, HPHRC, and then also working with our service delivery and advocacy partner, which was or is Planned Parenthood Global. So with APHRC, um, when I arrived, they were um, like, a little bit further in the data collection process than the team in Madagascar. Um, so they had pretty much finished data collection at that point. So most of what I did with them was coding all of those interviews. Um, it was a total of 98 interviews with one of my Kenyan colleagues. Um, and I really just used all of the skills that I had recently learned in Dr. Katalazi's qualitative methods class. I and mean, it was really wonderful to be able to uh, practice and apply those skills in the field. And then with Planned Parenthood Global, um, we had initially hoped to include some quantitative data in this study, and PPG was providing us with some uh, routine monitoring and evaluation data from their service delivery partners. So my scope of work with them was to help organize this data and get it into a database where it would be usable for our research. Um, so I ended up working, at, uh, working with their monitoring and evaluation team, and that meant that I got to go to a lot of these facilities that the data was coming from um, and see how the data was collected at the facility and become really, um, you know, familiar with that data. And, and then at the same time, we were trying to learn more about these facilities um, that the quant data was coming from, as well as the organizations that were supporting them. 
um, because we needed to kind of better understand how these facilities had or had not been exposed to the global gag rule, because that would in turn influence our ability to attribute any quantitative findings to the global gag rule itself. So that meant that I did a fair amount of um, kind of investigating and follow up with a bunch of these NGOs, um, asking a lot of questions about their grants and their financial histories. Um, and as you can probably imagine, like some organizations were super happy to give us that information and some um, were not or weren't quite able to give us that information. So um, actually like over the course of several months, once I returned back to Colombia, um, ultimately it kind of became clear that this data wasn't really gonna be appropriate for this particular study and we didn't end up including it. But for me, um, you know, I guess that was maybe a, a little bit disappointing, but mostly it was just a, a really good education in the messiness of data it, as it exists in the real world. Back to you, Naomi. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we also wanted to talk about our experiences since coming back from our practicums. Um, so one major role that we've had as graduate research assistants has, of course, to them has been to support qualitative analysis and paper writing for all three countries. Um, we've both helped to different degrees with all three country papers, and Maggie worked on um, Kenya with the Kenya paper serving as her pop fam uh, capstone project. Um, and we were tasked with reading coding queries for each country to take on um, to take in all this like incredible amount of data and to see if there were areas that made sense to follow up with in country. So maybe email or have um, our partners on the ground do another follow up call um, and then working on coding summaries where we gather different codes together um, under newly formed themes, which then typically became uh, key sections in the paper. And so for the fast past few months, um, on a personal note, we've had regular calls with ENSAC, go over any questions we've had about the data, talk through sections that we were drafting, um, and really get feedback from each other. So we've had a lot of working calls that have been really helpful, and have been really great um, since, like, when I was on the ground, there were um, some delays with, like, data collection. So being able to see this project, you know, kind of really from the beginning and through this paper that we've submitted has been really gratifying. Um, and again, I'll pass it back to Maggie to talk about our experience in Istanbul. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to, before we wrap up, just mention one more really um, cool project that Naomi and I were able to be part of. Um, in our work as research assistants on this project. Uh, we helped with a workshop that Columbia and the team hosted that actually um, Professor McGovern mentioned in her introduction, um, a workshop that brought together our research partners from Kenya, Madagascar, and Nepal, along with sexual and reproductive health and rights advocates in Kenya, Madagascar, and Nepal, and the US. And it was a five-day workshop where the research teams shared some of their preliminary findings, and then there were a series of um, like conversations and planning sessions between researchers and advocates um, to discuss and plan how our research could be used for advocacy on the ground in each of these countries to mitigate the impacts of the global gag rule. And this to me is like really what makes this particular research project so special because it's really research that aims to engage with advocacy and to be a tool for advocates and for policymakers. And it was just like so wonderful and inspiring to see these um, advocates who obviously understand their own country contexts and like national politics um, super well. And they were just so geared up and so ready to use the research that we were producing um, for like their very, very important work on the ground. Um, and yeah, so that, that is, uh, it's exciting to know that our research will be used in that way. Um, and then I think we just have a thank you slide and, oh, I'm sorry, we have another slide. Just kidding. No worries, we just wanted to um, show you guys what else is coming up for this project. So looking forward to publishing two more articles from Nepal and Madagascar. Um, thinking back to what Maggie just said about in-country dissemination with our local partners and advocacy organizations. Um, and then as um, Dr. McCover just said, we are um, publishing these in Sexual Reproductive Health Matters. So we're having a special um, issue launch webinar, October 21st, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
And finally, the Global Gag Rule um, Virtual Symposium. We have a Global Gag Rule Working Group, um, which is a space for researchers to share what they're working on, make sure you know we share what we've learned. Um, but this symposium in early December will be a space for researchers, advocates, and policy experts to share findings and experiences. It will be a space for, um, for us to speak post-election to continue to translate research into advocacy. Um, so stay tuned if we have any like uh, public facing events for that. And yeah, I think next slide. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think we were gonna drop the link to the special issue of SRHM in the chat so that people who want to read um, in more detail as these papers come out um, can do that. And also I'm gonna drop the link um, in the chat to, for anyone who wants to sign up for our monthly Global Gag Rule Digest, we send out um, a monthly email with uh, just sort of a roundup of media stories and literature that's been published uh, around the global gag rule. So I'm going to drop that link as well. And you just have to scroll to the bottom of the page and then enter your enter your information to sign up for that. So thank you so much, everyone. Sarah, were we going to have questions? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's open it up. Sorry, I thought you were taking that. Oh, I'm happy to. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We're no, open. A, a confusing. confusing. Yes. We love you. I also just wanted to jump in with one thing that Maggie referred to about the data that she worked on, the quantitative service delivery data she worked on in the summer. You know, we collected service delivery data for each of the countries. We just have not included them in the articles that we have currently written. We may be able to use them otherwise, but just we have a lot of data from this project and not everything made it into the sort of initial articles that were written. Just wanted to make clear it's not that the, you know, the data were useless, but just that they didn't make it into the articles. But yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand on your camera, unmute yourself. So just to um, chat while anybody, while some, while, while people think of questions, um, I think we also have a global paper that really talks about the impact on science and evidence and, and global governance that, that you know, the, the chaos that this policy is causing. Um, you know, we've been talking about specifics here, but of course the big themes of disrupting um, the integration of health services, there's been so much work to integrate health services, sexual reproductive health, HIV. Um, the gag rule is wreaking havoc in many different contexts. Um, and so we try to get at that at the macro level, at the country level, at the ground level in, in the various papers, which I think is also uh, an, it, it, an interesting aspect of this work. Um, and, you know, a very clear example of kind of governance, uh, funding as governance really uh, impacting people's health at the, at the access point. So, questions? And I should say the questions can also be to Naomi and Maggie about the practice that does not have to specifically be related to the study. So I have a question, I guess, if no one's asking a question, which is, um, I, you made reference uh, to Maggie, at least to being prepared from your qualitative uh, research class were there were there aspects of the experience the practicum experience that uh you could have been better prepared for you think um so we can learn from your experience naomi maggie um yeah, I guess I, I actually feel like I was pretty well prepared uh -huh. by the department and by my certificate for mm -hmm. for the fact that there would be like things that I wasn't prepared for. Like I was very much expecting that I would show up and there would be things that didn't go exactly according to plan. 
um, and that that was going to be okay and we were just gonna roll with the punches. And so when those things happened, it was not particularly concerning. Um, and, and I think that's actually totally a testament to how I was prepared for the practicum exper experience. Yep. I think I remember seeing you just when you had arrived in Kenya getting food poisoning or something. That's true. <laughs> yeah, but that was the only time. I only got sick that one time, so. You handled it very well. Okay. <laughs> we, must have, we must have prepared you for food poisoning. <laughs> tell me? Yeah, I think um, with the Global Health Certificate, we had a lot of sessions just mm -hmm. on um, like cultural competency, being prepared, um, and I think just getting us prepared for the unexpected, which is really hard to think about and get in that mindset. But I also think having that network um, of my certificate of the, um, we have like a group meet, WhatsApp group. Um, so that was really great just to have that network, um, even if we were all pretty far apart. Um, but yeah, I also think also knowing that I could like reach out to Emily, Sarah, um, Marta anytime and just say like, hi, this is what's happening. Um, and also being in constant communication, like we would try and check in once a week. So um, yeah, I definitely always felt supported um, and would say that even when things didn't go to plan, like we always had a plan, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Great. I, if no one has questions, I have questions to all of you, which is how do you think the working, um, it was very important to the donors that we actually engage with um, advocates from the beginning and really think about mitigation. Um, how do you think that changed the research? Did it change the research? I'm kind of looking at Emily, but. Yeah. <laughs> I could see. Um, no, I think I think it changed the research because, in a way, uh, we as researchers are also experiencing this policy in real time um, on us. I mean, it wasn't just through the global results that Terry mentioned about, uh, you know, collaboration and and science and the production of knowledge and evidence at the global level affected by the gag rule, but we also in each country, um, our ability to connect with participants depended on that chilling effect that I talked about and, and organizations' concerns around where we were coming from as researchers, making sure we were, it was clear this is confidential, this is, we're not part of the U.S. government, this is not a monitoring kind of study. Um, but we also in call, at least I can share a story uh, when we were doing our kickoff. And this is, again, I think something that's really important when you're doing research that is on a, a policy question, it's kind of intervention related that involves advocates. You should start off with that stakeholder engagement from day one. And we had meetings in each country to select uh, partners to work with. We also had uh, stakeholder meetings to kind of kick off the research, to explain our methods ask for feedback from the HR community uh, about what they thought in the global health community more broadly, but particularly those who are targeted more closely by prior iterations of the policy who have experience and knowledge about the policy already. We asked them about, what do you think about, about these methods? How will we capture various impacts? Um, but we in Nepal at our kickoff meeting uh, had about five to seven NGOs back out at the very last minute from attending, all saying, they all called in and said, oh, USAID is convening in a, a really important meeting that we have to go to. Um, can't come to your meeting. And we were really kind of shocked, actually, that this was on the radar of USAID and seen as a potential threat. Um, and so they pulled back uh, their people essentially through this uh, meeting. And I think we saw various interpretations or iterations of that chilling effect come out. Um, Maggie and I working in Kenya trying to do follow-up interviews, trying to broaden our participant selection to include or recruitment rather, to include more actors um, working HIV, for example, after the preliminary data seemed to show that integration was really problematic. Um, a lot of partners working HIV received U.S. government funding in Kenya and many were compliant with the policy and and so you, it doesn't always go the way you expect it's going to go and and I think adaptability in methods um, and in consultation with other partners and this kind of work is really essential throughout the process um, 
uh, yeah, so I do think the messiness that Maggie pointed out was definitely present through the three stages. And, and I think we also, as a research group, those, all of us, the four or five of us have always really wanted this data to be meaningful on the ground for purposes that are not just global gag rule related, but ongoing advocacy in each of these countries that's related to sexual and reproductive health. Um, and I think that's appreciated and, and understood in the countries and in turn makes it a little bit easier for us to enter certain spaces to collect data. So I think it's, it's very much a, a two way street. Being really transparent at the outset is important in this kind of work where the chilling effect really is a real thing. Fear is quite considerable in some of these contexts. Anybody else want to add to that? I just wondered, yes. I was just going to talk a little bit about Madagascar because Madagascar in some ways was quite different from the other two countries. Again, it had this very strict abortion law when we first went to Madagascar to sort of meet with some partners and, and sort of to help identify um, our research partner in country. You know, people were kind of like, I don't like, why are you doing this study here? Like abortion's illegal here. There's going to be no impact. Like you can't even do abortions because of the law. So like, what's the point in coming? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just in general, there was a little bit less um, sort of awareness or, and there was also just generally a little bit less advocacy around abortion. The country had recently passed a, a law to, um, on contraception and reproductive health, and the Ministry of Health had tried to include an explicit exception um, to permit abortions to save the life of a woman, and it had been knocked down. Um, so there, so it was a very different situation. And even like our research partners in Kenya and Nepal are both reproductive health organizations, so are very familiar and very involved in research. Had previously done research around abortion, whereas in um, Madagascar, our partner was, you know, a public and community health institution. So they've done quite a bit of research on, you know, contraception, family planning, reproductive health, but again, abortion was a little bit new. And it was interesting to see when we brought everyone together in, um, in Istanbul, you know, the partners from the research institution of Madagascar were a little, I think, I think it was a learning experience for them, sort of hearing these really strong advocates around abortion, just because there isn't that strong um, movement in Madagascar. And very interesting though, in the last couple of weeks as we've been trying to really get down to the analysis and sort of what are our key findings for the article we were writing, you know, I think they were almost, surprise at like how strong the impact actually was and really got down to sort of affecting women's lives and you know at the end they were kind of like this is a threat to our sovereignty and you know this is causing major damage to women here and how is this and it was kind of interesting to also see that trajectory in a place where I think people didn't expect to see such a strong impact. That's great I mean it's it's really really in, impressive and also the I think the the Madagascar findings are going to have quite an impact um, just for the reasons you described um, because the kind of thinking was there would be no impact which is of course okay. wrong. It looks like we have a question. So oh, good. Please. Yeah. Hi um, so I'm kind of coming at it from more of the like first year student trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so I'm interested in like SSRH and global health, but I was wondering for the, the student researchers kind of how you decided you wanted to go down the research route versus, you know, like policy work or working directly with NGOs. Um, I was just kind of wondering how you arrived at that point. Yeah, that's a really, thank you. Um, I think for me, I knew what my must-haves were um, in terms of a practical experience. And I think um, a lot of them did align with this. So for me, it was like choosing a place in Francophone Africa, making sure that it was like aligned with SRH. Um, I wanted it to be paid, things like that. So I think for me, um, I had experience working um, on another global gas rule kind of like fact finding paper. So for me, this felt like a really good next step um, to kind of see that in the field. 
Um, so for me, it wasn't necessarily like I need to do research or program. It was just more of like, what is this project about? How can I be useful? And where do I see myself going with it as well? I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, I, w I would say almost the same thing. Like I, um, I don't necessarily want to do research um, in my life going forward. And I knew that when I took this practicum. Um, but also I knew that this was an opportunity where I, first of all, I, I was working, you know, half time in my practicum with an NGO, getting to like experience some of that um, programmatic work. Um, and also just this, this did feel like a really sort of special um, research project to me that was very aligned with, yeah, my interest in SRH and my interest in global health. Um, so I think like if you're looking for a practicum, you know, sometimes, I don't know, you may not feel like the, the perfect practicum um, is available. Um, and I think that, you know, you can get a lot out of research, if, even if you ultimately then end up wanting to do program work. Great. Okay. Thank so, you. Any, I, again, I just want to really thank Naomi, Sarah, Emily, Maggie, um, and uh, Neha has been helping out, and Marta Schaff, who isn't on the call, but was a big part of this research. I think, um, you know, it's been quite a huge effort. Um, so, so really thank you to all of you and um, please uh, stay tuned on our various, on our launching um, and, and obviously please feel free to take what you find from us and share it around the world, particularly as we're coming into November. Um, so <laughs> I think it's all, it obviously is all connected. Um, what the next administration does, um, we're not going down a good path here, clearly. So anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you all. Anybody want to have a last word of our panelists? No? Okay. See you next week or whenever the next uh, seminar is. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks thank for joining. You. Bye. Thanks.